absolutely incredible to drive. Isn't this terrific? It is gorgeous. Best looking rear end in town, except my wife. And it's become a classic. It was just little subtle things they did that made the cars great. You know, it just evokes all kinds of, of warm, fuzzy feelings for me. He has made it a life principle always to do things better than they have been done before. So wrote a contemporary of Henry Leland some 40 years before Leland built the first Lincoln. 40 years before he would apply a passion for engineering exactitude to the design and manufacture of automobiles. Leland's stubborn commitment to absolute precision was the tool that would help him teach a fledgling auto industry exactly what a luxury car should be. After the war in 1920, Henry Leland introduced his own Lincoln car. And while it was beautifully engineered, it was not a beautiful car to behold. It uh, was stodgy, it was tall, it was dark, it was somber, and it didn't sell very well. And the company went to the wall. Henry Ford stepped in, bought the company for basically for his son, Edsel, who had a great eye as a designer. He spiffed the cars up. He was smart enough to keep the wonderful Leland engineering in the car, in the chassis, and this combination resulted in the Model L Lincoln, which brought them into the 1920s and through the 20s as a great prestige mark in America. Every Lincoln, for example, was shipped in its own individual paper bag and sealed in a dust-free railroad car. By the early 30s, the L series had been pretty well developed to its ultimate point, and Edsel Ford knew that a new car needed to be engineered. He had inherited one, and now he had to make one himself. And when he did, it was quite wonderful. This, this is a 1932 Lincoln KB coupe with a custom body. The KB was the top of the line for Lincoln. You gotta remember, they were being sold during, during the Depression. Uh, 1929, you know, everything slid off the face of the earth and it progressively got worse as we moved through the uh, 30s. And these cars were difficult to sell. Uh, Lincolns were conservative in styling compared to Duesenbergs and Cadillacs and Chryslers and stuff. Well, there was a certain uh, person who bought a Lincoln, probably a businessman that was successful, a wealthy family that wanted to have a lower profile uh, if they were buying a town car or something like that. What appeals to me about the Lincolns is the quality is extraordinary. Uh, the, the, the design's conservative. They're absolutely incredible to drive. Well, it, the, the KB's got a 12-cylinder motor, perfectly balanced. I mean, the engine is, is smooth. It's got a great power range. If you drove a Lincoln and then drove a Duesenberg, and, and, and you were just looking at drivability and quality of construction, and, and um, smoothness, the, the, its ability to brake and handle, you'd buy a Lincoln every day of the year compared to a Duesenberg. In celebration of the K-Series first birthday, the KB was chosen as pace car for the 1932 Indy 500. The K would soon prove as durable as it was beautiful and innovative. In fact, some K-Series V12 engines were driven for over 300,000 miles without replacement of the bearings or turning of the crankshaft. The Lincolns gained fame on two fronts. One, they were very fast cars for their time. They were favored by both rum runners and the police. So it must have been quite a sight to see one chasing the other. The bodywork was all custom work, sometimes aluminum bodies. The fit and finish, the quality of the material was up to Rolls-Royce standards. And uh, the car was very, very well regarded. They wanted to get a share of uh, upper class buyers but they didn't want to have cars that were gaudy, ostentatious in design. And they controlled that very carefully. Even though they sent chassis out to custom coach builders, uh, they adhered to a certain Lincoln standard. They did a great job on the emblems, the finishes inside the interiors, the inlay in the wood, the nickel plating uh, around the steering wheel and dashboard and that type of thing. Um, it was just little subtle things they did that made the cars great, in my opinion. I just love, I love looking down the hood. I look at, like the shape of the radiator, uh, the size of the headlights, the, the positioning of the headlights between the radiator. Uh, they're not up too high, they're not down too low. I can see right through them. I uh, like the Greyhound as it extends off the radiator shell. 
Uh, if you look at a link, a 32 Lincoln KB radiator, you'll see a 32 Ford, only twice as the size. It was a difficult time for anybody to do anything. I mean, manufacturers were going broke right and left. Automobile manufacturers were just dropping like flies. Um, and obviously the Ford financial resources allowed them to weather the storm versus companies like Duesenberg and, and much later Packard that, that just couldn't make it. After the KB, Lincoln decided that they had to make some money with their cars. And so they began to go for a lower priced line. It was streamlined, radically streamlined, and they called it the Zephyr. What is it? Wow, I've never seen anything like that before, but she sure was traveling. Well, it looks like news to me. I've got to get that. Don't worry, I've got it in my camera. Yeah, you may have it in your camera if your shutter works fast enough, but I want that story. Hey, Dave. Listen, Dave. Hold on, Jim. Look up. Never I'm mind that. Do you see that car? Mm. Well, I've got to catch it. Can you do it? Cash? The <laughs> spot cash, if you can do it. Okay, hop in. Well, Mike, turn it over. managed to maintain a separate identity for the Zephyr, which did not take the big Lincolns down market in the process. Well, thanks for stopping. I saw that car of yours whizzing by and I just had to find out about it. Now tell me, what is it and who makes it? It's the Lincoln Zephyr, made by the Lincoln Motor Company. Say, if this were an ordinary car, I'd be rolling all around. It's marvelous how she keeps on an even keel. It was acceptable to the public, whereas the streamlined Chrysler Airflow wasn't. It was a better design in that sense. Edsel Ford had always admired European styling and wanted to incorporate it in a car of his own. And we talked to Bob Gregory, who was the chief stylist for Lincoln, and they collaborated on a design based on the Zephyr chassis, which resulted in the stunning Lincoln Continental. Uh, this car is a 1941 uh, Lincoln Continental Cabriolet. It's an elegant automobile the day it rolled out of the factory, and it was an instant classic. I believe they started out with the, on the prototype uh, of the 1939 Lincoln Zephyr. They basically lowered the car and stretched the, the length of the hood, fenders, to give it a longer, sleeker, lower look, sportier look, uh, a continental look, so to speak, because Etzel had gone to Europe in 1938 and admired many of the European sports cars, and he came back with some different ideas about how a sports car should look. I seen the car for the first time in 1941 and just basically fell in love with it. And it made a lasting impression upon me. And, and we have a saying here, the best looking rear end in town, except my wife might pop up and say, <laughs> except mine. <laughs> it's an absolute beauty. Uh, I know beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but there's many people, even what I refer to as non-car people, will come by this car wherever it may be parked, standing, and simply admire the beautiful lines. And uh, children as well will say, hi, mister, what a neat car you got, not even realizing what it is, but it's a beautiful automobile, simply elegant. When Lincoln produced the first Continental, the embodiment of elegance and style, their marketing, oddly, had puerile artwork with simple, almost childlike trees and fluffy cotton wool clouds floating for no apparent reason, page after page throughout the document. One guy came running out of the gas station and commented on my beautiful Rolls Royce. And I said, that's fine, you know, if it's what you'd like to, to be, that's what it'll be. But naturally I told him it was a Continental and uh, probably one of the finest looking US built cars of its era. The 
original owner was a wealthy banker from New Jersey, and he had the Ford factory paint the color to his specs. And I, I have this on the assembly plant record, and the color they referred to when they're finished is Jersey Gray, a one-off paint job, if you will. And uh, looking back on our last 10 years of driving and car shows, the cars won basically every award it can win in a half a dozen national clubs that I belong to. It's, a, it's just an established uh, car and just a great driver. So I have the best of both worlds, a winner and a driver. To me, uh, the greatest feeling is slipping behind the wheel and driving off down the road. All my aches and pains disappear. Through the 40s, they continued with the Continental. But in the 50s, the early 50s, Lincoln lost their way. They really didn't know what they were producing. The Continental had been dropped, and it, they were producing cars that were winning the Mexican road race, but that doesn't certainly connote a luxury car. And 1956 was the turning point when they brought out not only a restyled big Lincoln, but the logical heir to Edsel's original Continental, the Mark II. And this car was so beautiful that it ended up as an exhibit in the Museum of Modern Art. 1955 saw the introduction of yet another Lincoln destined for classic designation, the Mark II, another startlingly artful design. Like Continental, the Mark II was produced in limited quantity. However, its influence and impact were major. Its styling was elegant and unique, avoiding, as the original Continental did, the design excesses of temporary fashion. This car is called a Continental Mark II. Not a Lincoln Continental, but a Continental Mark II. People just got the habit of calling it a Lincoln Continental. Ford invested so much money that it came down to, in 1955, $100,000 per automobile. The most expensive Cadillac limousine was around 6200 This car with air conditioning delivered for 11700 The term stratospheric I think applies. The car was conceived as an umbrella to go over the whole Ford Motor Company line. And as such, it was never considered as something that they wanted to make a profit. For instance, you could build an entire Cadillac limousine in the time it took to paint a Mark II. Mike Todd bought one from Elizabeth Taylor and had it painted kind of a violet blue so it worked with her eyes. And she had blocks put on the brakes and the gas pedal so she could reach him because she's quite tiny. Little fact, that hood ornament was made by a gun sight maker. It was solid cast brass and was more expensive than the entire grill of a 1957 Ford. When you sight down the side of the car, it's a testimony to the automotive worker's art that the sides were flawless. You could just take the line and sight down it all the way and it's perfect, everything meets. They put the hump where the hidden tire is on the trunk because they decided if there was ever a signature for an automobile, like the three-pointed star or the Mercedes grill or the Rolls Royce flying lady in the grill, the hump was indigenous to the appeal of the Mark II. This is the first day I went to work at Sears Roebuck and Company in Chicago, and I was running quite late to catch my carpool. And I come whipping down the stairs and out, and I skidded on my loafers all the way out to the curb because there sat a maroon Continental Mark II. 
I was literally salivating over it. So while I'm standing there ogling this car, a gentleman comes up and kind of looks at me and then he looks at the car and then he looks at me. And I said, isn't this terrific? It is gorgeous. I said, this is my first day at work and to see a Continental Mark II is really exciting. I said, you know, it's just kind of too much for one day. And he said, I work here. And I said, you do, what do you do? He said, I'm president and chairman of the board. And this is my car. And I looked at him and I said, wow. Many, many years later, going out to Rockford, Illinois to a car auction, and over in the corner of a shed was a maroon Mark II. I looked in the corner of the windshield, and believe it or not, there was the Sears Roebuck and Company parking sticker. Same car. And I went ahead and bought the car, and I took it to a local repair shop, and I said, what can you do for six or seven hundred dollars? I think that'll about do it. And the fellow looked at me and he smiled and he said, you're new to this hobby, aren't you? As the simple elegance of the cars declined into the gargantuan, ostentatious and vulgar cars of the late 1950s, so the text of the brochures began to state classic elegance in motor cars, classic beauty and excelled craftsmanship, sheer elegance is the look of Lincoln. I suspect that the copywriters had never seen the cars in reality. The cars produced between 58 and 60 were called the Lost Lincolns and, and they suffered from I think a case of Cadillac-itis. They had to be longer, they had to be lower, they had to be wider, they had to be flashier, they had to have more chrome trim. Unfortunately, this did not make for a very good-looking car. And the story goes that one day in late 1957, Henry Ford II, who had virtual dictatorial powers at Ford, marched into his styling department and said, I want you people to design a car that I am not ashamed to drive to the Detroit Athletic Club without somebody laughing at it. And the result was the 61 Continental. My grandfather uh, bought his first Lincoln in 1925, and uh, it was apparently a very flashy thing, burgundy with a black top, and he was extremely proud of it. That, that was his first uh, Lincoln, and this was his last. They bought it new in June of 1964, and I was six and a half years old at the time, and uh, somewhere there is a picture of me standing next to it that very first day that I saw it in my cowboy hat and six guns. Uh, but I can remember many times sitting here in the front seat, in the middle of the seat, looking down the hood through the star and aiming at other cars on the road. Just kind of a fun childhood thing. So the car itself brings back a lot of tremendous memories. And I feel very fortunate that, that uh, we've got this car now to uh, enjoy not only those memories, but also uh, uh, to enjoy the beautiful sunshiny days when you can still put the top down. It's got a 430 cubic inch engine. Uh, V8, and uh, it's an enormous car. It's uh, a real Luxo boat, as we'll call them here in, the, in this country. Very, very comfortable, uh, very classic of the 1960s. It's over 18 feet long, it's uh, well over six feet wide. Uh, it has very luxurious accommodation inside for six, and then a few if you uh, need to pack it in. It makes for a very, very luxurious travel on the highway, uh, but even if you're just driving it by yourself, it's very comfortable. The very unadorned slab-sided design, the uh, simple chrome trim right along the leading edge of the fenders, uh, it all led to a very simple unadorned look that was almost shocking when compared to the Cadillacs and Imperials of the same years with which they were competing. People were really appreciating the simplicity of design and it's become a classic. With one push of the button here on the dashboard, uh, it does the uh, whole system entirely itself, the whole operation. Uh, first the back uh, boot opens up, a little flap comes up, and then the top unscrews itself at the uh, windshield pillar, and it folds itself down into the boot, and then the boot cover comes back down, 
and uh, it locks itself in place all in one operation. Very smooth, as long as it works. These have a reputation for being a little bit of a problem. There, if I remember correctly, there are 11 electrical relays, uh, four circuits, and two reversible electric motors, and uh, they are known to occasionally have a blip in them, and they will stop working, and you can't put it back up, and you can't put it back down. Uh, you're stuck. Uh, fortunately, it's only happened once. It was about a year ago at a car show. We'd put it down and it operated flawlessly. Went to go put it back up and it wouldn't do anything. You know, the, the car also, I think, at least certainly to the American public, has kind of a more infamous appeal, if you will, because uh, it's very much identified with the Kennedy assassination. I don't know, you know, what effect the Kennedy assassination had on Lincoln, per se. The poor man happened just being a Lincoln because that was the official White House car. Ford Motor leases those cars to the government for a dollar a year. Uh, what I did find amazing in researching that car is that... Uh, it stayed in government service through the Carter administration. It was just another member of the motor pool. When I look at that badge on the dashboard that has my grandfather's name on it, which was sent to him by Ford Motor Company shortly after he bought the car, you know, it just evokes all kinds of, of warm, fuzzy feelings for me. It's, it's a wonderful family connection as well as just something very pretty to drive. The decade of the 70s saw Lincoln build on the formal styling precedent that the Mark III had established. The rounder, sleeker Mark IV replaced the Mark III and immediately outsold its luxury coupe competition. Other Lincoln innovations of the early 1980s include the industry's first electronic instrument panel message center in 1980 and nitrogen pressurized shock absorbers and industry first in 1982. The contemporary transformation of the Lincoln model line was completed with the launch of the 1990 town car. I like what they're doing. I hope they succeed, but they've got a lot to be proud of. It's a wonderful mark with a great tradition, some great triumphs behind it, and I hope some ahead of it, too. Today, Lincoln stands at the pinnacle of the automotive world, and Lincoln automobiles are more desired than ever before. Exactly what Edsel Ford had in mind when he charted Lincoln's course so many years ago. I want to build the best car in the world.